Welcome to our panel today. We're going to be co talking about uh, conscious crowdfunding. Uh, I feel like nowhere are the benefits in crowdfunding more visible uh, than in giving to the public good. Uh, whether you're a teacher uh, using crowdfunding to pay for classroom supplies uh, or an individual donating directly to de disaster relief, conscious crowdfunding uh, is really shifting the way charitable giving is working. Uh, and to talk more about this landscape, we have an excellent panel. Uh, to my right is Sarah Margolis, the CEO of Honey Fund. And then to her right is Daryl Hatton, the CEO of Fundraiser. And uh, to the right is Ingrid Imbri, Managing Director of Global Giving. And, and they can talk more about their platforms as we go along. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, just to start, uh, you know, you guys have all been involved in hugely successful, uh, really seen hugely successful campaigns go on your platforms. Uh, can you just talk about how the crowdfunding landscape has evolved in the last couple of years on your own sites, uh, how you're seeing changes in the industry, what trends you're, you're looking at right now? Sarah, I don't know if you want to start. Sure. Well, it's interesting. Coming from Honey Fund, it's, it's a honeymoon funding platform. And Weddings is actually one of the first uh, real use cases of crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. We started Honey Fund in 2006, before crowdfunding was a word. And so it's kind of been a fun way, uh, a fun adventure for us to pioneer in this space. Um, what I've seen change over the years, we launched a sister site, Plum Fund, in 2013, around the time that GoFundMe was coming up. And we started seeing a lot more personal crowdfunding. And that really came from our own uh, wedding couples saying, hey, you know, we would love to do this for a community project or uh, my parents' anniversary party or, you know, baby funds, birthday funds. And, and for me, it was just born out of this one use case. Um, and now people, now that we have the technology, you can do it, you know, for anything you care about, really. Mm -hmm. How about you, Daryl? You know, it's interesting. Um, we started early as well. We started Fundraiser in 2009. And we're a general purpose platform, meaning we can help people raise money for personal causes, for charitable causes, for social entrepreneurship, or for just entrepreneurship, raising money in a Kickstarter-like model. And the thing that's been interesting to watch over the time is the evolution and sophistication of the types of campaigns that are running and the, uh, uh, the ability of people to raise lots of money for some very important causes close to their heart. But one of the things that happened early in the very early days was Facebook was such a wide open platform, we were able to get massive visibility for a lot of these causes. And now as it's maturing and it's putting in its revenue model, it's getting more and more challenging for individual causes or nonprofits to be able to reach out to the people that are interested in supporting them. And uh, that's one of the challenges I think we're going to face moving forward is this distribution problem. Good point. Global Giving started in 2002, as, <laughs> and we call ourselves the first global crowdfunding site. So we did say crowdfunding back then, but um, the market correctly. is supposed to be $96 billion for crowdfunding in developing nations by 2025. So that's pretty amazing. 67% of people say that they'd like to give locally. Yet, in international disaster relief, less than 2% of it goes to local organizations. It's something that we are hoping to change slowly but surely, getting more money to community-led organizations all over the world. We work in 170 different countries. We work, for example, with Facebook. Whenever somebody marks them, themselves as safe in some sort of a disaster, if they turn on the donate button, those funds come to Global Giving. We figure out what community-led nonprofits will receive them. Right. And, um, I, and we can definitely talk more about transparency and accountability in a, in a moment. But uh, I did just want to ask you guys if there are specific trends around demographics that you're seeing geared more toward crowdfunding mm -hmm. versus traditional CSR. Um, you know, what sort of shifts are you seeing in terms of the, the people who gravitate towards these campaigns? And also, what type of campaigns have, you, have resonated with, with those demographics? Is, is there a shift there? Uh, I, yeah, I think that's one of the big things that's driving the industry right now is the shift from millennial donors, or sorry, from boomer donors and those very early on as they're maturing. They had one style of the way that they were used to being communicated with around causes. And there was some characteristics of it. It was more of a given that you'd do this as part of society. It was an obligation. And sometimes it wasn't needed, it didn't need to be visible. And now as we're shifting into millennials and the groups afterwards, which for convenience, let's call them the internet generations, there's a lot of differences in the way that they look at these problems and the way that they want to give and the level of participation. So it's going to be one of the big influencers in the way things evolve over the next little while in the future of crowdfunding 
because they're very results oriented and they're very much wanting it to be part of who they are. They express themselves sometimes through their philanthropic activity and through their social movement activity. Mm -hmm. So this is a, you know, the great advantage is that we can take advantage of that and help get the message out and, and get more people engaged in it, more very much actively engaged in it, doing advocacy work. But the challenge is that we have to change the technology in order to make that do it so that we can scale it more effectively because it, it's a lot more information that needs to be had and transferred for them to be, feel satisfied with the results of, of their giving. And, and sorry, we, we were talking before um, just about some of the surprising categories that, that you've seen, starting from Honey Fund. You, you, uh, could you talk about some of the ways that people had used Plum Fund in different ways than you might have anticipated when you first started the platform? Sure. So, so we started Honey Fund, obviously catering to wedding couples. We now have millennials coming into the wedding market, so that's a big demographic shift. Getting back to your previous question. Um, and then we saw them coming on the Plum Fund and wanting to do the next life event, baby showers, birthdays, anniversaries. And now we're, uh, we've opened up a divorce category, which is an interesting kind of full circle for the, for the company. <laughs> but um, also because more and more divorce is something that um, people are going to need some help financially with. We, we haven't even talked about the financial position of this generation mm. and how much savings they have and if they own homes or not. And all of that impacts their need for personal crowdfunding. Mm -hmm. So divorce is another one of those um, interesting campaign categories that came out of Honey Fund. And, and is that a sign that there's just a broadening understanding of what counts as philanthropic donation? I mean, if Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, I think people want to help their friends and family, the people closest to them, as Ingrid said, local, you know, local impact. And, and I, let me see my, my donation doing something good. Um, in the case of couples getting married nowadays, they live together, they have everything they need for their home, they may not have enough savings to cover the wedding and the honeymoon, and this is a way for friends and family to take that $100 they were going to pitch in anyway, or $200, and put it towards something the couple really wants and needs. You can do that same, apply that same principle to, you know, a birthday coming up, I want to I wanna fund my favorite charity for my birthday this year, don't buy me a pretty journal or a plant by, you know, put 20 bucks in to save the children in Africa or something like that. And Ingrid, um, just getting back to that, the, the idea about accountability uh, and transparency, it seems like this is both a matter of wanting to donate to more, a broadening set of categories, but also making sure that result has an, I, uh, an ROI. Um, how are you guys thinking about that? How important that is, is that to, to this field right now? It's supremely important. Um, on the front end, doing the due diligence on the nonprofits and making sure that they're really doing what they're doing, that there are no Foreign Corrupt Practices Act violators on their board or staff, you know, that, that their budgets look good, et cetera. But then once they receive funding, what is the report back? What does that look like? And ours are sort of narrative reports that come back to all the donors to say, this is what happened with your $25 in Haiti. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and Daryl, I think you were talking about how that can actually boost engagement you're seeing, the more transparent you are about the, the sort of campaigns that uh, are on your platform. Yeah, and especially around um, the idea of the, um, the Internet uh, generation donors looking for the, the accountability for results. Give you an example of a story um, of kind of the transformations that are happening in the nonprofit world, going from major gifts into micro gifts and going from major projects into micro projects. There's a charity we know of called One Girl Can, and they emphasize uh, giving girls education in Eastern Africa. They used to fund schools as a whole, donate towards the school or our programs for helping girls. And what they're piloting at the moment is donating directly to the funds supporting individual girls. So they do small crowdfunding campaigns that are related to each of the girls and as a result, the donors have a direct connection to see the results of what their money really did. Mm -hmm. And even more importantly, they can start getting results back from the girls that are involved about, hey, I'm going in for my chemistry exam. I'm nervous. Mm -hmm. And there's a crowd that's there to support them in many ways. And when she comes out and says, I passed, there's happy dances going on in North mm -hmm. America for someone who yeah. just passed a, a course mm -hmm. in Africa. So that's an example of, of both the idea of, of um, changing from a major project to a micro project. But also, those donations can be quite small then. It's not a big grant. It might be $25 a month right. that's going on a recurring basis to this girl's project 
until the project's complete. Might be two years. That's a really interesting crossover between cause fundraising and personal crowdfunding, right. where you're really making a one-to-one -one connection with the person that you now care about. Exactly. Right? And bringing into your world of friends and family. And that caring is the real motivator here. It makes a huge difference to yeah. how long someone will be in, engaged in these campaigns. Mm -hmm. We're really, this is a discretionary spend. The, so we're yeah. competing against entertainment. <laughs> in some ways, philanthropy might become a form of entertainment. And, and the mm. more results you show, do you see recurring uh, contributions from, from people if you're more transparent about that? Have you noticed any data around that? Or? Yeah, and they, they start giving a gift and then they see results happening and they're willing to give more gifts. Mm -hmm. And that may turn into a steady stream. Mm -hmm. Right. So it, it's, a, it's a quite a big change that's going on. Mm -hmm. We've also done experiments with behavioral economists like Dan Ariely and Mike Norton who um, play with the notion of generosity and say, you know, if other people if 75% of donors to this project give today, we will give a match. And they show that if other people are being generous, they will up their gen generosity. Mm -hmm. Right. And um, I, I did want to also ask you, Ingrid, just because uh, Global Giving works directly with some pretty big corporations. And crowdfunding, uh, you know, is all about empowering the individual. What role do companies, larger corporations, play in this new landscape? How, how do they adapt to this, this uh, new reality of CSR? Well, as you know, consumers want to support companies that are doing good. Mm -hmm. Employees want to work at companies that are doing good. Investors want to invest in funds that have companies that are doing good. Mm -hmm. So there's this big crowd swell, ground swell of interest in social investment mm -hmm. across the board. Mm -hmm. So we work with companies from Apple to Zynga to do employee engagement and cause campaigns and disaster relief and, and just plain vetting to make sure that these nonprofits are actually who they say they are mm -hmm. and that they have good reputations as well. Right, right. And along those lines, I mean, the, the idea, I feel like one of the larger challenges for companies getting involved in this field is that reputational risk. Uh, I'm not sure how much overlap this goes for, for you, Daryl, or you, Sarah, but how do you advise companies on, on navigating that uh, risk factor just because some of these campaigns that people get involved in uh, could be more sensitive, there could be cultural connotations, there could be political connotations. Um, how do you advise companies in this room just sort of navigating that? Well, it's a couple of things that go on. I mean, I think that there's some parties in the world like Global Giving that are doing some vetting and making sure that these causes are valid and that they're, they're doing the things that they say. But also from the company's point of view, it's very important that they're selecting companies that match not only their, their goals and their kind of corporate uh, philosophy, but that of their consumers, particularly now. This has been never more important, is that you have to align with what those consumers want and the consumers want to feel like they're partnering with you as a company, as opposed to, you know, you're making some generous things and, and they're disconnected. They actually want to participate in those projects. So the more the technology, one of the benefits of crowdfunding technology is that we can scale those types of things, where we can get those participants working together with the company to fund the causes that they care about. And uh, it can be good for business because it's, it's driving a loyalty and an alignment. And it can be good for the cause because Face it, corporations are way better at marketing this stuff than most causes are. Mm -hmm. So they can get the message out to a much larger audience and engage that audience in a much better way. Weber Shandwick did a study in January of this year that said that more people are interested in being involved in a boycott than a boycott. Mm -hmm. So they're more interested in buying the products from the companies they believe in. Mm -hmm. Right, and especially, I mean, considering some of the success, uh, uh, Nike, for example, I know that's one of the companies you work with, um, had run into controversy earlier this year around some of the campaigns they'd been getting involved in, but it seems like that type of political activism is perhaps what people are, consumers are more hoping for. People are expecting CEOs to take stands. Mm -hmm. Yep, yeah. And, and Sarah, do you want to add anything to that? I was just going to say, I think the Nike example aligns with what you were saying, Daryl, about the companies standing for what their cons consumers stand for. And, yeah. and they took a risk that their consumers really do stand for that. And, it won for them. It's worked out so far. Yeah. yeah. And are there other big challenges that uh, are top of mind in the, the coming year? What, what's, what sort of, what hurdles do you see for this uh, crowdfunding landscape? And I see actually a lot of opportunities. Um, crowdfunding is consolidating from an investor, investor perspective. Honey Fund is looking for an investment round uh, in the near future um, to grow both Honey Fund and Plum Fund to the next level. And there's, there's a lot of um, interest from sort of ancillary uh, industries 
that could potentially have an, a crowdfunding play, for example, for us at Honey Fund, travel is a really interesting category, and mm -hmm. the, the couples that raise money on our platform could turn around and spend it on travel. So um, being part of a, a transaction on two sides, the gift that comes in, which is obligatory, by the way, and then the spend that goes out into the travel industry, that's an interesting pairing. And there may be other ones in uh, the world of social responsibility and um, giving um, to charities. So it's just something to, to think about, opportunities mm -hmm. there. For sure, yeah. and I can give you another example of that. We're working with a uh, food bank in Vancouver and Canada, and one of the uh, uh, corporations that's involved is one of the big uh, grocery chains. And the grocery chains are going to reward donors who are giving to the food bank with reward points in their loyalty program. So it's an incentive that's going back, and their idea is kind of buy food, get food for yourself. An interesting way to leverage the power of the corporation and do that. I think we're gonna see a lot more of this because it's getting increasingly difficult to deliver a marketing message out to a consumer using traditional advertising and, and media. And so and in, in this way, the social feed becomes a place where you see the, the companies doing good in the community, not in a big ad campaign, but in a one-to-one -one interaction with your friends on Facebook, talking about the good work that they're doing in the community. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's a bit of a transformation in an advertising business as well, it's also mm -hmm. touching this. I would say we're, we're seeing a lot of different things, uh, continued authenticity, continued transparency needs. Mm -hmm. But from a global perspective, I see, we see more protectionism from different c countries. And so we really have to stay on top of, I think there are 185 regulations globally right now that are looking at tightening um, the nonprofit financial markets. So it's something we really have to stay on top of and we've got to full compliance team that's just doing that. Right, right. Um, and I, I, you know, one of the other areas I did want to ask you guys about is just sort of the limits that you guys do see to conscious crowdfunding. Is there only so many things that crowdfunding can solve? Uh, in other words, sometimes you do see campaigns that are donating to an individual rather than the underlying cause. Uh, so I'm just curious if there are sort of limits to the things that a Kickstarter campaign or a GoFundMe can actually tackle uh, versus that sort of traditional macro approach to, to philanthropy? So there's, um, uh, you know, there's a large list of things that are still difficult to fund. And uh, a lot of the characteristics of what's emotional. I mean, if it's a very dry topic, we tend not to give to it because we give because we're emotionally driven. We actually Absolutely. make an emotional decision and then rationalize it. Mm -hmm. Malcolm Gladwell <laughs> and Blink said that. You know, that we, we make that decision and then we have to rationalize it with some data. And that uh, a lot, if there's no emotional connection, there's no reason to really make it. But let me tell you a quick story about a, a kind of the weirdness of what you can crowdfund. We have one of the projects on our platform, it's called uh, the American Gut Project. And it's the University of California, San Diego, is funding the study of your microbiome. All the little um, creepy crawlers and, and bi um, biological elements inside your body. And they're doing that to help determine health. It's now become probably one of the largest crowdfunded science projects in the world where they've raised uh, over $3 million for this. And what they're doing is engaging the crowd in citizen science. The crowd is paying for poop collection kits, if you could imagine, <laughs> and getting voluntarily participating in the study, getting their own data back, and changing the result for everyone because they're supporting the science study. So that's an idea of a real outlier in the way you can do it. But you know, the hard things are usually scientific research, but with the right kind of marketing approach, right. those things can also be solved. Right, and is there a thing? Yeah, I would just say um, engaging, uh, if, if it is a particularly challenging topic, really engaging the, the, um, the donors at a personal level, like you said, oh. at an emotional level. But, uh, Plum Fund's tagline is giving feels good. And that's just really what that site is about, and giving feels especially good to people you know and love. So bringing in that personal element, I think, is the key. Yeah, and I think the harder things to crowdfund for, the more creative you need to be. So if you think about the Ice Bucket Challenge and ALS, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that brought a lot of visibility and funding to that yeah. hard to explain situation. Phenomenon, Phenomenon. for sure, yeah. Right. yeah. I mean, in, in terms of like, how much marketing uh, dollars do you, do you hope to go more toward crowdfunding in the next year? Are you seeing that trend uh, sort of shift uh, in the attention on social media that are getting from these sort of donations versus a more traditional macro donation? I feel like, once again, I'm bringing back to 
authenticity. YouTube stars are popular because they're authentic. Marketing dollars, <clears throat> when they look like marketing dollars, are now kind of being ignored by younger generations, right? They want a real person and they want to be able to relate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Daryl, do you have anything to? Um, I think that, that said a lot. The, the yep. big thing that um, we see is just, you know, if in the competition for attention now, how do we help causes stand out? Mm -hmm. And uh, authenticity is one of the ways because uh, especially the internet generations are very naturally attracted to this authentic experience. Mm -hmm. You know, who are you really? What do you stand for? And how does that matter? And oh, by the way, we need money for a project. Right. Though, you know, it's almost a secondary effect, a side effect mm -hmm. of getting aligned with them and what they need and money will flow out of that. Uh, and the last area I did just want to talk to you about is just hopefully we can zoom out and just talk about hopes that you guys have for the year ahead of crowdfunding, how you expect to it evolve in the next two to three years. Um, yeah, what big uh, sort of either techno technological advances do you see going toward crowdfunding? Mm -hmm. uh, do you expect more companies, larger tech companies to get involved in this field to sort of partner with you guys? What do you hope will come uh, in 2019, 2020? I definitely see the technology um, in the fintech world getting, you know, really, really slick. You know, mm -hmm. we, we have people literally sitting in the pew at a wedding donating on Honey Fund and emailing us and saying, can you make this easier for me? <laughs> <laughs> so we're looking for our partners like PayPal and WePay and Braintree to really give us like very, very slick um, donation options. The, the recurring donations is one. Mm -hmm. um, and just continued support around fraud protection and taking some of that fraud risk off of the platforms and, and having them be part of the service provided by the FinTech partner, I think is, is something that we're looking for. Yeah, I think, and uh, I'm surprised the thing you didn't say that in the next two years you're going to have a big financing for this to help you grow. So I'll uh, kick <laughs> I that back that for earlier. you. I touched on that earlier. I didn't want to. <laughs> I'm just going to add on a little there for <laughs> you. Yeah. See, another thing Are about about <laughs> philanthropy is it starts with generosity, right? We yeah. have to support each other in yeah. doing these things. Yeah. But I think the technological innovations you're talking about, an ease of the payment experience and an ease of the communication experience is going to be a big yeah, thing. Yeah, communication for and, sure. And I think that one of the big trends we'll see is the back, the back channel coming back. Just like one girl can, girls reporting on what's going on. Um, Charity Water did a fantastic job of telling what the money was used for and showing where the wells that they were digging in various parts of the world that the specific well that you helped dig mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the results that flowed back for that. Mm -hmm. That backflow of information mm -hmm. is technologically a little bit challenging, organizationally a bit challenging, but that's where I think the technology will help. Mm -hmm. okay. And then on the fraud side of it, um, you know, there is the concern. We are constantly having to police for bad, mm -hmm. bad types of campaigns on the, mm -hmm. the platforms, and more information sharing within the industry is helping cut that risk down quite substantially. Oh, yeah. Right, and, and you had actually talked about it uh, before in terms of like the pipes, the, uh, essentially that are driving uh, sort of the technological undergirding of the, the system. You talked about just partnering with Stripe and, and companies like that that can play a role. In yeah, and, and Stripe and PayPal and WePay are kind of leaders in this, uh, both in terms of fraud detection and avoidance and also in ease of payment. We're really looking forward to having it, you know, I think I'm gonna support it. Okay, there's my thumbprint on yeah. now I've supported yeah, exactly. it. And now there can be communication around that. That's, I've authorized to spend by touching something. Mm -hmm. And now I've engaged in a conversation by touching something. You know, it's at multiple levels in that, that the mm -hmm. technology can make it a lot easier for all of us. Mm -hmm. Right, yeah. And Ingrid, do you? And I think that the global compliance things that we need to deal with, like GDPR and other things, um, are also, you know, challenges, but, but <coughs> hurdles that we can definitely jump over. But I would love to see much more collaboration. For example, Global Giving has an open and free API. So if you have a website and you'd like to fundraise for Hurricane Michael, pull that information from our site and put it on your site. Mm -hmm. um, we have API agreements with a lot of different platforms. Would love to work with everybody in the world so that more people mm -hmm. experience more goodness. Mm 